This is Neurology Recall, a collection of our most useful, practical, and educational podcasts on a wide variety of topics selected from our Neurology Podcast Collection. Whether you are new to neurology and training or have been practicing for many years, Neurology Recall is designed to help you continue to learn the essentials of neurology easily, one podcast at a time. Hi, it's Jeff Ratliff with the March 2024 Neurology Recall episode. This month, we're coming to you with part two of our two-part Neurology Recall series, compiling the November Headache Series from 2023. Part one was featured back in the February 2024 Recall episode. In the first interview of part two, you'll hear Tisha Monteith speak with Dr. Masood Ashina on the mechanisms of migraine, which aired on November 2023 on the Neurology Podcast. In the next segment, you'll hear Tisha speak with Peter Goadsby, updating our knowledge on migraine treatments and CGRP inhibiting medications. Finally, wrapping up this six-part compilation of episodes, Tisha spoke with Stuart Tepper on updates in neuromodulation for headache. We hope you enjoy this second installment from the November Headache Series, and we'll see you next month on the Neurology Recall. This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening, and have a great week. Hi, this is Tisha Manteith with the Neurology Podcast. We're back with the November Headache Series. Well, if you've been following the field closely, you'll know that there's been some exciting advances in the understanding of migraine, but yet so much more that we still need to sort out. Today, I'm here with Professor Masood Ashina, Scientific Director of the Migraine Research Unit in Copenhagen. I invited him on to help us gain insights into the mechanisms of migraine so we can better understand our patients in clinic. So let's talk about migraine mechanisms. Let's start with the basics. What causes migraine? Well, this is a tough question, Tisha, and this is one of the most, let's say, frequently asked questions when I see people with migraine in my clinical practice. They usually ask me, what causes migraine? Well, to Put it in a, let's say, more and less simple way, I would say this is a very complex disease with a strong genetic component, and it is believed to be a neurovascular disease because it involves abnormalities or alterations in neural and vascular control or tone, we can say it. And there are various factors that contribute to the migraine pathogenesis. I already mentioned genetics, but also environmental and also some like uh, hormonal factors. And quite often people with migraine, they think that the cause of the migraine are different triggers, such as stress, certain foods, hormonal changes. But we can also say, based on the knowledge on the data derived from the basic science, that the migraine as a disease can be affected by the neurotransmitter levels that usually cause so-called aseptic inflammation, vasodilation, or increased excitability of the neurons at the different level, at the peripheral and the central level. And as you mentioned, migraine as a neurovascular disorder associated with many genes, over 123 genetic factors have been found. Can we talk a little bit about how, at least what the field is aware of in terms of the genetic factors contributing to migraine susceptibility? For many years, we talked about genetics in context of migraine, and our hope was that we can find a single gene explaining the migraine, but the things are far more complex. In fact, there are some rare subtypes of migraine when we know that the single genes, or we call them also monogenic type of migraines, they can cause migraine or cause at least the symptoms that we know that are migraine symptoms, such as aura and also migraine headache. And we see that advances in genomics and in general, a better understanding of the genetic factors, they contributed also to what we see from the science, to the migraine susceptibility. And we hoped and still hoping that that this will pave the way towards the precision medicine, so based on the genetics. But right now, all these calculations are made by quite large sample, you know, the people with migraine, and they cannot be easily translated into the clinical practice. But 
there is no doubt identifying the specific genetic markers and understanding their role in migraine. In the future, they can maybe help us to tailor treatments to the individual genetics profiles. But this is something, I would say, in a very premature phase right now. And another aspect of genetics is that also help us to understand the different signaling pathways involved because if we can correlate this risk variance identified in this genomic status, so we can correlate them to the certain transmitters or the signaling pathways, and it will also enhance our understanding of mechanisms underlying migraine. And you also spoke a little bit about uh, some hormonal, physiological factors, environmental factors. What do these triggers tell us about the migraine brain? Migraine triggers is also one of the important topics and also popular topics when we see people with migraine in our clinics because they mention these trigger factors such as, you know, stress, diet or other factors. One of the problems, Tisha, is that the, most of these so-called trigger factors we hear from the patients based on the retrospective analysis. So they mention these factors and it is retrospectively, but how reproducible those factors are if we start collecting data prospectively. This is a really good question. So we need more studies to understand about these triggers because not all triggers are the same for the patients. You know, some people, they might get migraine after exposure for stress, but other people with migraine, they have a frequent migraine, but not necessarily stress-related. So it's very individual and how reproducible those factors are. This is a good question. The same goes also for the alcohol. It's not reproducible all the time. And that's why when we talk about that, it is we have to be very careful not to tell the patients avoid everything that it is possible and mentioned before in the literature or by people with migraine, because just avoiding everything can also be a factor reducing the quality of life. If something which is very obvious and it's quite reproducible in individual patients, then we might say, well, you should avoid that. But otherwise, it's quite complex. I think one of the remarkable things is as we talk about lifestyle factors and thinking about the migraine brain is the impact on homeostatic functions. All our human physiology, it's about the balance. And when we talk about lifestyle factors, it's not only we talk with people with migraine, with people with other diseases, especially with metabolic syndromes, you know, we talk about the lifestyle. And it is also becoming increasingly more and more with age, right? And we also know from the population-based studies conducted in U.S. that one of the major modifiable, I would say, factors for chronification of migraine, transformation from episodic into chronic, is also obesity. So, and the lifestyle changes potentially can improve the migraine. But I still think that it's not the whole thing explaining the migraine. We need to combine talking about these factors with the pharmacological interventions, especially people who really need the treatment because of the frequent migraines and severe migraines. That's what's important to find the balance about that. Great. And we're going to talk about the pharmacological interventions, but I want to start with some of the basic stuff. For example, migraine aura. It's long believed that cortical spreading depression is underlying substrate of migraine aura, but is that too simplistic of a consideration? While this cortical spreading depression, I would say the more correctly will be cortical spreading depolarization, is widely recognized in migraine with aura, But considering it as a sole pathological substrate might be, in my opinion, too simplistic. Because migraine is quite complex. The way we think about the aura, we think about the following sequence. We say, well, first you develop aura and then you develop migraine headache. But you're a clinician, Tisha, and you know that some patients, they report headache already during the aura phase. Some patients might also report aura after the headache start, you know, after the onset of headache. It's not, as we say, usual presentation with aura and then the headache. There could be some variations in this context. It's important to remember that the migraine is a complex, and that's why one single mechanism cannot explain everything. Another aspect is that we recently showed, for instance, that some of the pharmacological triggers, such as the CGRP or left chromocholine, which is the opener of the KTP potassium channels, 
they trigger aura symptoms. But what is interesting is that patients first develop a head pain, you know, so it's kind of in a different sequence. We see first activation of trigeminal vascular system, then development of aura symptoms after the triggering within the one hour, gradually evolving into the full-blown migraine attack associated with uh, photophobia, phonophobia, and other symptoms. But the sequence which we usually think that first aura, the cortical phenomena, and then the migraine headache, it's not so obvious when we talk about the pharmacological triggers. So maybe there is something else. Maybe the system must be activated first, and then it causes the cortical spread and depression. Because right now, when we talk about the cortical spread and depression, we think about that, that something triggers the cortical spread and depression. But what is something, we don't know. So that's why there are many questions. And another important question is that some people try to extrapolate data that we gather usually from the preclinical and clinical studies focusing on aura, that we can extrapolate that data into the patient's, our understanding of mechanisms underlying migraine without aura. But to date, we don't have any evidence suggesting of something like a silent cortical spraying depression or depolarization in patients with migraine without aura. So it's also a very interesting aspect of migraine pathophysiology, and more studies are needed you know, to understand these mechanisms also in migraine subtype without aura. And so we spoke a little bit about migraine aura, but let's step back a little bit more about migraine as a multiphasic disorder with the prodromal periods, possibly aura, headache, and postdrome. What's new when we think about the phases of migraine? Yeah, this is also a very interesting aspect. When we talk about the phases of migraine, the phases usually also implies the duration. But this is a very difficult question when we talk about the premonitory or premonitory symptoms or prodromes. Because how long they should last, when they should be developed when we start calling them premonitory symptoms or premonitory phase. One of the most frequent symptoms mentioned in the literature is yawning. But you know, every individual in the world, they yawn, you know, maybe three, four times a day. Is it a prodrome is it premonitory symptoms. If you put it in context to the migraine, then why not to call it just a start, you know, just a migraine attack or migraine attack. It starts with these symptoms and that's it. There is no such things like a special aura phase. Usually we say that migraine attacks with aura, when you have an aura, it is an attack. And migraine with aura can be also solely aura symptoms and no headache at all, but we still call it the migraine attacks. So why we should call it a phase, why we should call it a symptoms not related really to migraine attacks, or we call them as something occurring before the head pain. I think it's too much focus about headache phase, and that's why people try to convince everybody that this is something different, and it starts before the headache phase, and this is important because it relates to the central nervous system. Well, I understand this point, and I respect this opinion, but we need more data on that. In addition, that recently we did a systematic review on all premonitory symptoms, and we identified more than 90 symptoms. And it's very difficult to say which one is important for individual subject and how predictable the symptoms are when we talk about prospective data gathering. So it's quite complex, let's say, area of research. And we just think that it is important, but we need more data on this topic when we can say, well, it is important in such extent that it can affect our decision, uh, you know, treatment decision making. Particularly, you know, when we talk about the treatment during the prodromal or premonitory phase. So that's why it's an important topic, but I think it requires more. And we cannot say it's, a, it's a very specific for migraine because some people also reported these symptoms in cluster headache, during the cluster headache attacks. So it's an interesting topic, but more research. So I'm seeing what camp you're on, <laughs> and I get it, it's data-driven, you're a scientist. And I think that you've raised a couple of points. One is that it's migraine. You know, migraine is more than a headache. So I think we're all saying the same thing. But as you mentioned, there's potential therapeutic implications to targeting the prodrome, which while people have been thinking about that for some time with other even, even long-acting triptans, it's a therapeutic opportunity to potentially help patients. Yeah, I agree with you, Tisha, but we have to be careful with one thing. 
if we don't understand much about these symptoms, you know, and how they play a role in migraine pathophysiology and what are the implications if we start treating the patients during the prodromal or premonitory phase, uh, we might have some problems. Let's assume that somebody wants to take a triptans during the prodromal phase. The problem is that we are risking that these patients, that they start taking too many triptans, and we know that the triptans are one of the modifiable factors involved in the transformation from episodic into the chronic migraine with medication overuse and causing the medication overuse. We have known that for many years. So if I start yawning every day, you know, and start taking the triptans every day, I might have a problem. Then you might say, well, maybe it's not the case with the G-pans. Well, it's fine. You know, you can take the G-pans during the so-called premonitory phase. But then you are gradually transforming of taking triptans, not as an acute treatment, but as a preventive treatment. And then, of course, it's going to work because we know that the G-pans are very good, you know, in preventing migraine attacks. Then suddenly your acute treatment becomes preventive treatment. You know, you're taking every day almost or every other day because you yawn or you feel tired and you feel that maybe migraine attack is coming. So this is the reason that I'm saying that uh, recognize the importance of these symptoms, understanding of these symptoms. But I think that uh, more studies are needed to see how specific they are and how sensitive the symptoms are in terms of the treatment. Because for migraine attacks, we definitely know that the people develop photophobia, phonophobia, and we know that when the headache starts going away, all these symptoms, we call them also sometimes most bothersome symptoms, they also go away in tandem with headache because we treat the, the headache. And when we're preventing the attacks, we also reduce the symptoms. We also know about that. So it's an interesting topic, but I think we need more data. I agree with you about the more data. And I think when we think about treating patients, certainly there would need to be tailored approaches and specific patients that would need that treatment plan should they want it or need to treat during the premonitory phase. But then you also mentioned something about this increased blurring between what we think as acute treatments for migraine and what we think as prophylactic treatments for migraine with the G-pants. And I think some neuromodulation being good examples of that. Correct. So I think we did speak about some controversial areas in migraine. Any other topics that you just want to one, two, three, what you think are some big areas of controversy? I think that the triggers, again, you know, because when we talk about the triggers, how reproducible those triggers are, this is, in my opinion, also one of the controversial uh, topics in migraine. Another controversial topic is about estrogen. The estrogen has been around in migraine pathogenesis for many years. You know, the estrogen withdrawal, fluctuations, are the potent uh, triggers for migraines. And uh, but but the problem is that the, the data that we are operating with, you know, we recently also reviewed this data about the estrogen hypothesis. It's uh, poor based on the study for many years conducted in six patients and only three patients that was showing that the drop in estrogen was causing the migraine attack. But it's absolutely not sufficient to claim that. So again, not denying that these factors are extremely important in migraine pathogenesis, but also with some clinical implications. But we need also more research in this field. It just illustrates that we have to be careful when we're going and keep referring for something being conducted 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and taking as obvious, as, you know, like an axioma, you know, and we believe in that and that's it. We need to question that. And with the modern technology, with the modern modern approaches to things, you know, we can redo these studies and we can understand better very important aspect of the estrogen and migraine. The hormonal aspect of migraine is extremely important. And also why some women after menopause, they still have migraines. Why some stop having a migraines. Why in older adults, you know, you see sometimes still frequent migraines and in some it just vanished, you know, it goes away. There are many interesting, controversial topics that uh, we need to understand. So you spoke about the estrogen withdrawal hypothesis, and I think that's a valid point that we need more research. What emerging research is there with the role of estrogen and neuropeptides such as calcitonin gene-related peptide and potential interactions that might explain 
migraine. Yeah, this is also a very popular topic right now to explain efficacy of medications, the new biologics, but also the anti-CGRP receptor, small molecules, the GPANs, in terms of the uh, treatment response, female versus male. But the problem is that, again, none of the studies, the power to study this aspect on the differences in response based on the gender. But what we see that in the monoclonal antibodies, at least trials, there was no such a difference between these two group patients. Another aspect was also about how the women and men, they could be different in terms of the hypersensitivity to the CGRP. In fact, we just published a few days ago a paper on the CGRP provocation experiments, how the hypersensitivity that was exploratory analysis, how the clinical and sociodemographic factors, they can influence the CGRP-induced migraine attacks. There were a number of different factors including the gender factor, but there was no difference in terms of hypersensitivity between men and women in this study. So showing that they were equally hypersensitive when we infuse the CGRP and provoke migraine attacks. So this area is still important, I would say, and needs more research and more answers are needed. But I think that, again, we need a good powered study. And I think we always talk about response rates and things like that, but what do non-responders tell us about migraine biology and in specific CGRP inhibition? Yeah, but this is also a very important uh, topic, non-responders to CGRP inhibitors. When you look at this long-term data, I'm talking about the status after the randomized clinical trials, the double-blind phase. Most of the status included so-called open-label phase. And during this open-label phase, they assessed long-term efficacy, safety, and tolerability of the different medications. I'm talking about the new medications. And usually when you see, you see the nice curve showing you a nice long-term efficacy and safety and tolerability a year after, two years after the treatment initiation. But one major problem is the following. If you look at the number of patients after the double-blind phase enter the open-label phase, and you look at the numbers of patients still there in a year or two years after, you see a significant drop. And of course, you would see a nice response because all of the data that you have at the end of the collection period, those who are responding. But what about the discontinuation? What about those people who discontinued for the different reasons? Could be tolerability, could be lack of efficacy, different reasons. So that's why I think that we need to talk now about the retention rate. How many people stay still in the treatment in a year and two or three years after the initiation of the treatment? Do the patient develop tachyphylaxis, you know, and it stopped working? So those are very important questions, including the questions, why some people not responding? We try to address this issue in our experiments because we know that many people are now fearlessly searching for the biomarker to explain why some people are responding, why some people not responding, why are some poor responders, super responders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It is a notoriously difficult to find a single biomarker, I would say immediately, but we keep trying. One of the things we try to do is the following, because based on the clinical trials, we see that about 60% of people, they're responders, and about 30 to 40% of people not responders. When we give the infusion of CGRP to people with migraine, about 60% of participants develop migraine attacks after the start of infusion of CGRP. And about 40%, they do not report. Well, we ask the question, can this hypersensitivity explain the treatment response? And the obvious was that to start giving this provocation, start these provocation experiments before the people enter the treatment and start treatment with one of the monoclonal antibodies. And we did it with uh, Arenobab just to see that those who are hypersensitive to CGRP, they will respond to Arenobab. And those who are not hypersensitive to CGRP, they will not respond to Arenobab. But the, what we found was quite surprising. Even those who are not responded to the CGRP infusion. In other words, they did not report migraine attacks after the infusion of CGRP. At least 60% of them had an effect of, you know, of Arenobab. So 
we fail to show that this infusion can be used as a test to predict responders or non-responders. Just to illustrate you how difficult this topic is, you know, but I'm sure that many other colleagues around the world, they're trying very hard to understand that. The problem is also, Tisha, that you need to find something which can be easily applied in the clinical practice. These fancy experiments with imaging, they are imaging studies based on the number of patients, the group comparisons. You understand what I mean? So it's very difficult, I mean, almost impossible to apply these methods in the clinical practice. We cannot do the imaging and then they start the treatment and decide based on the imaging whether we're going to treat or not treat this patient. So that's why we need a really robust and validated markers so we can predict and then we, we don't have to go through the treatment. So right now we operate with the following, let's say, concept that it is three months treatment. If people respond, they respond. If not respond, either we switch if it's possible in some countries, in my country, unfortunately, it's not possible to switch due to lack of efficacy, or we stop the giving the treatment. So this is the way we operate. So we don't have a predictors yet. So let's talk about some of the triggering experiments that you mentioned. Give us some of the major takeaways. Uh, you mentioned one, the lack of reproducibility at times and the lack of us being able to understand response rates to predict medication response. Is there anything else? And, and I know there are a number of different uh, pharmacological agents. The experiments that we conduct here in Denmark, in my opinion, are important because what we do, we're trying to identify different signaling pathways in vivo in humans, which is quite unique that you cannot do it in other diseases, right? I mean, we cannot provoke MS, we cannot provoke Parkinson in people suffering from these diseases because it would be impossible to do that. We're talking about that uh, progressive and chronic diseases. In case with migraine, when we know that the various factors are triggers for migraine, such as alcohol or other factors that we talked about before, you can actually trigger the disease because it is self-limiting, it goes away, and you can treat that. And upon, of course, consent from the patient, you can try to understand migraine pathophysiology by giving the different, the various triggers, the natural occurring molecules that are possibly involved in migraine pathogenesis. And if this particular signaling pathway provokes attacks, then you have uh, this specific signaling pathway involved in pathogenesis, and maybe you can uh, develop something that can inhibit this pathway by, let's say, by inhibiting either the ligand, the molecule itself in human body, like we have uh, anti-ligand monoclonal antibodies against CGRP and possibly in the future for PACA, but also uh, their receptors. So this kind of experiments opens the new avenue of new possibilities for the drug development. That was the case with the CGRP. These experiments contributed in the CGRP discovery in migraine. We talked about PACA as a possible target. What I'd like to mention about the proof of concept trial, which was called HOPE trial. And this trial was designed to access the efficacy and safety durability of a single intravenous infusion of the monoclonal antibody against PACAP for migraine prevention. And this study was conducted in adults with migraine who had two to four unsuccessful prior preventive treatments. And in this study, the primary efficacy endpoint was the mean change from baseline in the number of monthly migraine days over weeks one to four, okay? And two doses of the drug was administrated intravenously over 30 minutes, and this study was a placebo-controlled study. So this trial met the primary endpoint of a greater reduction of monthly migraine days over the weeks one to four with anti packup monoclonal antibody high dose versus placebo. So this trial was a positive trial and demonstrated in the proof of concept trial that anti packup monoclonal antibody was efficacious in migraine prevention. And importantly, it was well tolerated and no safety concerns were observed. But in order to firmly establish the efficacy of this drug in migraine treatment, we will need the next phase, phase three status, 
And this is something that I'm sure it's in the planning stage, and we will hear more about that in the next years come. And one of the things that we're also doing here is that focusing on so-called intracellular mechanisms. Because the, most of the molecules that we inhibit now on receptors, they're on the surface of the cell. They are the upstream mechanisms, but they are also downstream mechanisms. By provoking migraine using the, the downstream molecules, we can achieve a higher migraine induction, suggesting that in fact, that those mechanisms are important. And one of the recent studies that we published recently in Brain showed that even if we block the CGRP receptor, but with very powerful medication, the monoclonal antibody against CGRP receptor, by giving the drug which acts intracellularly, we were able to induce migraine attacks the same magnitude if you give a placebo. So meaning that, that the CGRP blocking effect was not efficacious in this case. And that's why maybe some migraine patients still report migraine attacks, because it's not just a single molecule, it's much more complex. And by targeting these intracellular mechanisms based on the data derived from the human experimental status, maybe we can have more efficacious drugs. We don't know, acute or preventive. This is something that the future will show. So you've already kind of alluded to a number of new targets that we should be on the watch for, but go ahead and list them out for us. I'd like to mention the PACUP. The PACUP is a, one of the natural occurring molecules in human body. In, in human body, it exists in two isoforms, PACUP 38 and PACUP 27. So it's just a difference in terms of amino acids, but PACUP 38 is more widely distributed compared to the PACUP 27. And back in 2009, where for the first time showed that intravenous infusion of PACUP induced migraine attacks in about 60% of the patients. Very similar to what you see with the CGRP infusion. At that time, we suggested that the PACUP or PACUP's receptors could be a target. Well, what is interesting about the PACA, PACA is also in the big family of peptides with another peptide important, vasointestinal peptide called VIP. And both are acting on the same receptors. And these receptors are located in the different compartments, including the vascular uh, smooth muscle cells, but also in uh, neuronal cells. And while they share these receptors, we studied the difference between the PACAP38 and VIP, and we found a difference. In spite of being both very strong vasodilators, we saw the different responses in terms of migraine induction. More than 70% of the participants developed migraine attacks after the PACAP38 and only 18, 20% after the VIP. So this difference we explain maybe by preferential effect of PACAP on the so-called PAC1 receptor. And we suggested that the PAC1 receptor could be a new target. The monoclonal antibody was developed against this PAC1 receptor, but the study, unfortunately, was negative. So they didn't show any difference between two doses of this monoclonal antibody compared to the placebo. Well, some people say then this receptor is not involved. Some people say maybe it's more complex. Maybe you need a splice variance of this receptor in order to achieve this anti-migraine effect. What is interesting about this PAC1 receptor, it's located in neurons, but not really found in the vessels. I don't know if it's a difference. We only think that I can say that when you give the PACAP infusion, you get a long-lasting dilation in spite of the short half-life of PACAP. You know, uh, immediately after you stop the infusion, within the 10 minutes, it should be gone. But apparently, this effect of the dilation lasts for four hours, you know, at least four hours. For the VIP, it was very short, and maybe that's why um, so few patients develop the attacks. But uh, a couple of years ago, we published a paper when we give a two hours infusion of VIP. And then we achieve the same induction rate as after the pack up, after the two hours of fusion of VIP. So those receptors, VIP receptors, VIP itself, pack up receptors, pack up itself, they are not our drug targets. And the recent study, the proof of cost of study, which was presented during the International Headache Congress in Seoul in September, reported that the two doses of uh, anti pacap monoclonal antibody against pacap was efficacious, safe, and well-tolerated. And that was a double-blind study. So, but as I mentioned before, we need more studies, particular phase three studies, to firmly establish the role of pacap and also with the treatment implications. 
One last thing I'd like to mention about the PAC, and it's, a, it's an interesting question I usually receive from my colleagues, it's about could it be that migraine patients are different in terms of signaling pathways? In some patients, CGRP is involved. In some patients, the pac is involved. Could it be that those who are not responding to the CGRP monoclonal antibodies, because CGRP is not involved in their migraines, but pac is involved, and maybe the anti pac agents could be efficacious in these patients? Well, it's a good question. We don't know about that. Whether the pac induced migraine, it is dependent on the CGRP, we don't know, but I can tell you that we conducted a study when we tried to inhibit pacup induced migraine using the anti-CGRP monoclonal antibody, but I don't have a results right now. But the major question is that whether the pacup signaling pathway is still dependent on CGRP or not. If it's not, we have an interesting perspective. First of all, I think that anti pacup agents, if they're efficacious, they can be used the same level like we use the anti-CGRP agents because we need to study that in all patients and apparently if most of the patients are responding, so the pack up signaling pathway is involved. Then there is a prospect also to study in patients who are not responding to the CGRP. Okay, it's fine. We can also study in this patient. And the third option is that in the future, maybe the combination, maybe a combo effect, the anti-CGRP and anti pack up This is something very interesting and we have to study in the future. Excellent. I I think this is such a fascinating conversation. It's so nice to see different targets and different ways of thinking about the migraine mechanism. I want to ask you one last question about some of the more recent breakthroughs in our understanding of migraine. What excites you the most? Well, there are many interesting things are going on in research, but what I think that uh, what excites me now more is uh, we're going back to imaging. I think that imaging to understanding the fundamental mechanisms are very, very important. And I do see that the people are planning and doing some experiments, very nice experiments, using the imaging to understand the basic neurobiology of migraine. The symptoms that we mentioned before about the premonitory symptoms or prodromes in context to understand what are the sites of these symptoms, you know, and how they relate to the migraine pain, etc. So all this circuit of the different events during the migraine attacks are very, very important. One of the major challenges what I see in imaging is reproducibility, but I think that we're going to figure out this issue together with other colleagues. We need some consensus about that, how to study, and that's why I try to call my colleagues also, you know, to discuss this topic because it's important and I see a lot of potential of imaging. Another aspect that I see the potential is that, of course, in the drug development, there are many things are going on still. The whole area of migraine and migraine treatment, it's quite exciting and more things are coming. I can promise you. Another thing that I mentioned from our research, from our lab, it's about the signaling pathways involved in migraine, in particular the downstream mechanisms, intracellular mechanisms. We have more studies coming up. The studies focusing on this aspect and trying to understand whether, again, these mechanisms are dependent on CGRP or the pack up on other molecules, the upstream molecules. It's also a very interesting topic about the migraine hormones. It's a, it's a very, very popular right now. I'm sure that the more status will come. But again, we need rigorous status. We need, a, from a methodological point of view, very good status to understand this important topic. Genetics will be still around, but I think that will take uh, more years before we can start using genetics in the clinical practice because it is still quite complex, you know, when we're talking about identifying the genetic factors which contribute to migraine susceptibility, but also to the treatment responses. The studies that I mentioned before about the CST, cortical spreading depression in relation to migraine, still very, very important. And I would like also to mention importance of the preclinical studies, you know, the basic science. You know, these experiments are extremely important. Regardless how much we can do translational research in humans, such as I mentioned before with human provocation models, we need preclinical models. Uh, we need models in animals to understand things that we cannot really study in vivo in humans. So those studies are very important. And so I think that the most important discoveries I would mention last couple of years is uh, the role of pack up, I would say, because this is something 
potentially can bring a new treatment, I mean, in a very short period of time. So this is why I think it's important. Well, typical of you, you're excited about everything. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being on our podcast and helping us shed the light on a really difficult condition. Thank you, Tisha. Hi, this is Tisha Manteef with the Neurology Podcast. I'm back with our November special podcast series in headache medicine. Today, we'll be providing an update on CGRP inhibition and integration into clinical practice. I can't think of anyone better to discuss this with than Peter Goatsby, Professor of Neurology at the University of California, Los Angeles, and Director of the NIHR Clinical Research Facility in King's College, London. Hi, Peter. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for asking me. Always a pleasure. I remember when Arenamab, the first CGRP monoclonal antibody, was announced. I remember what I was doing. <laughs> I remember who I was talking to. I remember the first prescription I wrote for Arenumab. It felt weird to be writing a prescription for a, a medicine that uh, I'd been interested in for almost my entire professional career. It was a very weird experience, I have to tell you. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, the road of CGRP inhibition in clinical practice. What more do we know um, from 2018 or even beyond that? I think one of the lessons of the CGRP era, if I could say it that way, and it's it's not that long yet to be an era, but I think in retrospect it'll be looked at like that, is the underestimation that we've made in clinical trials and sometimes in clinical practice, but I think more, almost more in academia, and there's a reason for this, the underestimation of the importance of tolerance as well as efficacy, tolerability, that is to say, as well as efficacy in the use of preventives. We've typically used migraine, monthly migraine days, headache days, 50% responder rates of the same, and measured efficacy. And we can show many of our uh, older drugs work quite well. The percentage of population who respond are quite good. However, if we ask them whether they like the drug, well, they can barely answer the question. Uh, with some of the side effects that they get. And I, th I think that we missed a trick in not being much more intentional and attentive to the importance of efficacy married with tolerability. At the end of the day, a person has to live with the medicines we give them, and we don't want the consequences of that to be so troublesome that the benefit get outweighed by the side effects. So I think that's the great lesson, the whole package. And, and the way I do that, and I, mean, I think we all do it in clinical practice, when someone comes in and you look at them, the first thing you, you more or less ask them after you said how they are or you know, sh shoot the breeze a little bit is, you know, how's it going? What's it like? Where, you know, wh where are we going? That sort of thing. Everyone has their way that they say. It. And what that's captured in now in clinical trials, of course, is patient global impression of change, which is just a fancy way of saying it, how are you going? And has a and has a mark. And if you look at studies, there's a very nice study that Patricia Poza Rosich and the Spanish group published to show that the thing that absolutely predicts maintaining arenumab, for example, therapy at 12 months is patient global impression of change, unsurprisingly. And I, I think that this move to patient reported outcomes and really being attentive to the needs of our patients, that's probably one of the meta messages from the CGRP era. So I hear you about safety. I think that's hugely important. And, you know, efficacy as well, and you say that they're married together. Is there any biological predictors of a CGRP response? Well, none that I know of so far. It's rather disappointing in that way or frustrating as, for clinicians. I mean, I, I love the fact that I can see someone and prescribe CGRP pathway medicine. I hate that I that they go away with reasonably high expectations and a group of them are utterly disappointed. And I don't know how to do better with that. But it is certainly one of the challenges. Since the pathway is pretty clear, the target's pretty clear, and the outcomes are pretty clear, it should be one of the challenges we take on in the next five years or so to work out a little bit better who's going to respond better. That would be good for everybody. Yeah. And in addition to who's going to respond, Walk us through how you choose uh, a CGRP inhibitor, which one to use, either one of the monoclonal antibodies or now the GPANs. Well, the first thing is what's available because you can only choose from what you have, number one. And number two is if it's available, 
how can I, is it prescribable? What I mean by is it prescribable, is it on the formulary, is it on the insurance formulary, is it on the national formulary, is the person going to be able, if it wasn't on the national formulary, you know, are they of means to be able to purchase it? Can you actually do it? So there's no point telling someone about something that they can't have. That's just cruel and inappropriate. So the first thing I try to do is understand what it is that's available for the individual who's involved. And then I think it's quite important to set out the options rather than tell a person what to do. Because I think the, as much as I'd like to think I try to get to understand patients that I see, I never cease to be amazed by when I present the options that they go for an option you know, I just I wouldn't, have, wouldn't have guessed they would have done that. So I kind of set it up on it like a, a shelf that they have in the CGRPs that they have first the monoclonals, three ones that you can inject yourself once a month or one and one of those you can inject once every three months or one you can get an in, inje- injection into the vein every three months. Okay. And you've got tablets and the tablet ones you might take every second day or might take uh, every day. Um, fundamentally, the response rates are not much different. So obsessing about that is not going to help anybody. And the side effects are modest and broadly speaking, comparable. Now, if someone's got poorly controlled hypertension, I don't use that as an excuse to change monoclonal. They need control of their hypertension. I mean, must never forget doing our, you know, the basic medicine properly. If someone's got GI problems, they may or may not think that mild constipation is an issue. I certainly have quite a number of patients who've gotten constipation from various of these medicines and are perfectly happy with the medicine and would prefer to use prunes or some other um, laxative because they're so well. We should never underestimate how dreadful migraine is and it it's not, shouldn't be surprising to us that a person will want to persist with a medicine even if it's got some mild side effects. Indeed, we've done that in the past years. So I set up the options and see where they're headed. Most people will have a decision based on what someone else told them, what some relative told them, what someone down the street told them, maybe in the US what they saw on the television. They'll have a view and I'll be able to sort of pick that view so that they get the thing that they actually want because a priori there's not much reason to take um, take one or the other. And if I'm forced down a road, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be simple. I, mean, I think basically the choice is between do you want to inject yourself once a month or do you want to take a tablet? And if I, if I can't get a, a, an answer out of that, then it is going to be about what can I easily uh, prescribe. And in some places in the world still it's only the monoclonals in some place uh, it's the it's the tablet and try and understand it i think uh, most people have a preference and if they select the thing that they want they'll do it and if they do it and you've got compliance you'll get exactly what it says on the jar because these things perform as well as they do in the clinical trials in my experience so you'll get what you can what you can expect i think listen to the patient is the answer to what to use first what's going to happen of course is that we're going to be Anyone who's tried a, a G-Pant as a preventive who's failed, very reasonably, we're going to give them a, a monoclonal and, a, and vice versa. And you'd think that would be a useless pastime, but it's not. There's plenty of real world evidence to suggest you can swap from one monoclonal to another and pick up a percentage of people, maybe 20%, who weren't responding. And you think, wow, that ought not be the case. And from an intellectual point of view, it's frustrating. But from a clinical point of view, it's just great. How do you switch? When uh, Take us through how long you keep a patient on a prophylactic therapy. Does it differ, differ from the orals? And when do you decide to switch? Well, switching is driven by a couple of things. And again, it'll, be, it'll vary in people's practices. For some people, I think switching will simply to do with what their follow-up time is. You know, in many of the government-run systems and even in private systems in the US, the follow-up time is quite difficult. Because if you can't see someone for three months, well, you're not going to be able to switch anyway. Broadly speaking, I think three months is perfectly, uh, is, is pretty much a minimum. You can see from early work we did with some of the monoclonals, from the nice uh, work that uh, the Italians have done, a, a nice multi-centre study where they looked actually at what happens if you continue on, on treatment. It was a really nice study, um, um, Piero Barbanti is the first author, and they looked at the group of people hadn't responded at, t- at three months who continued on the same thing for another three months and about half of the non-responders responded in the second uh, second three months. So there's a, that's pretty, it's a pretty good study. They had nearly 700 or a little bit more than 700 uh, 
participants in the study, so it's a decent size. Now, that said, I think at three months you, you have the conversation. If there's any hint that something's going on, then that multi-centre study would suggest you should push a little bit longer and try and get out to six months, and then you can be pretty sure that you're not going to be moving anywhere. I think that partly is the reason why when we swap at three months, for example, to from one monoclonal to another, that some people respond in the second, uh, in the next three months, not because they were changed, but because simply if the longer you expose someone to this mechanism, the more likely they are to respond. That's one of the sort of intellectual things that we might try to sort out in the next few years as well. From a patient's point of view, like, so what, as long as they're responding. So I think somewhere between three and six months is a reasonable place and the Barbanti data is a good way to, to argue that. So beyond the clinical trials, the pivotal clinical trials, you spoke about this long-term study. What other long-term studies or real-world studies do you think have really kind of shifted views and clinical practice? Oh, I think the real-world studies that we've seen from our uh, Italian colleagues, from our uh, German colleagues, from our Swiss colleagues, have all pointed to a theme that if you treat people for 12 months and then you stop, then a substantial group, more than half, maybe two-thirds, will revert in their frequency. And what they say is that it's not unreasonable at the 12-month mark to ask yourself to for a patient to continue. You have about a two-thirds chance of getting worse and a one-third chance of staying staying well, more or less. And that's just it's an approximate number to have a have a discussion around. And that means whatever decision you take is or the patient takes, more importantly is correct because if they're if they're worried about it coming back i can see why they want to continue if they want to try to stop that seems perfectly reasonable faced with those sort of numbers and what we've seen and you know in three separate studies done in separate countries same outcomes broadly speaking i think continuing is pretty reasonable and the largest group that i of patients i have who when we have this discussion want to continue and then something we were talking about earlier, is that so surprising? We say migraine's a horrible condition. We say it's horribly disabling. People lose time, they lose function. It interferes with their life in many, many ways. We say that, and then we say to people who are well-controlled, would you like to try being like that again? I mean, it, you know, it's, it's like someone saying to you, if you've got a broken leg, would you like to try it again? What a great yeah. idea. I'll just break your leg and see how we go. But I... I I think it's reasonable when patients look at you and think, well, no, I'm really well. You know, my life's really great. I'm back at work. Everyone joins. Everything's, things are really great. Why do you want to rock the boat? So I'm in the be, I'm in the be patient camp. If when At 12 months, I'll, I'll say, well, I think what I know about the data. And if a person wants to continue, I think that's perfectly reasonable. For how long I'm going to continue to say that, let's get some more time, more to go under the or to go under the bridge. We certainly haven't run into any long-term side effect uh, issues, so there's no immediate downside to that. And there's a, there's a lot of upside because you, you've got people functioning normally in the community and happy, and that's exactly what we want. Yes, um, I totally agree with you. And I think uh, Richard Lipton says it well that uh, these drugs are not disease-modifying drugs as well as they work so well, and patients can go literally down to headache freedom. Um, they're not disease modifying. So you stop them and naturally, because migraine is a cyclical disorder, some people are going to be in remission, but others are going to get worse. And so we have to remember that. The drugs are life modifying. Yes. Because because if you lose a day today to migraine, you're not going to get it back. You're never going to get it back. So in terms of your functional life, they actually prolong your functional life. And we talk about you know disease modifying I understand that means what happens afterwards, but I think disease course modification is something they do since every day a person is functioning normally when they wouldn't have been functioning normally is an extra good day of their life. And I think I think we should frame the conversation a little bit like that from the point of view of the patient who's got more days and society who's got this functional member of the community back together. So I see a half glass full aspect of it, the disease course modification that's happening with these drugs. That's a really nice a nice way to take a look at it. Um, so let's just talk a little bit more about some real world observations. Uh, it's helpful in the setting of medication overuse, headache, it's wonderful, seems to have an additive benefit with on a botulinum toxin A. 
Um, what about the combination of the monoclonal antibodies and GPANs? We're seeing that a lot more, this dual, dual therapy. We are, and that's... I mean, again, you wouldn't have started out thinking that was a good idea at the, at the start. You would have think to yourself, well, everything should be covered. But the, the pharmacokinetics predict that. There's a nice predictive paper, Kilbasa and Kilbasa, I think, and, and, uh, and uh, Helton in cephalalgia a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, which looked at the um, behaviour. They, they looked at levels of galcanizumab and plasma and, and, CG, and CGRP and saw the dip and then the recovery of uh, CGRP over the three-month period into between treatments. They were using 300 milligrams at the start. And then they did some nice modelling, which shows that whatever the dose is, you don't end up flattening, at least theoretically with the modelling, you don't end up flattening the CGRP level in the body because it ends up with a, an equilibrium at a lower level but with an equilibrium. And, of course, that's uh, panned out now in the Phase 1 studies. There's a nice um, Phase 1B study with, uh, with uh, ubrojapant and arenumab or ubrojapant and galcanizumab, which shows that the um, you know ubrojapant pharmacokinetics is not altered at all, plasma concentrations with either of those medicines, and you don't see any more adverse events. So the modelling phase one and real world data all point to what I think is broad clinical experience that there's no there's no downside to trying. Um, a G pan on top of a monoclonal, or indeed trying a monoclonal on top of uh, a G pan that's being used for acute treatment, or even a, a G pan and a G pan, uh, something like a tocilizumab on top of an abortive. I know there will be some clinical trial data that will be later presented. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So um, let's just talk about tachyphylaxis, you know, and then let's talk about the non-responders. Well, when we talk about tachyphylaxis, I, I think you're, we're referring to say, people who are stable monoclonal responders and then the thing stops responding. Is it tachyphylaxis or is it a change? Is it the disease itself uh, evolving? And you could think of that in, in practical terms as the same thing, but I'm not sure it's pharmacology so much as disease, uh, disease evolution. And if you, you know, I've seen people now with migraine over a couple of decades and they go through good periods and bad periods, and you see them in the bad periods, and you don't see them for four or five years, and then they six years, and they pitch up again, and everything's been fine, and then it's not fine. I've seen that happen with all of the classic preventive. So I think much of what we're seeing is as much the disease changing itself, disease course, as it is a change in the pharmacokinetics, pharmacology of the of the CGRPs. I don't think it's something that's unique to CGRP. It's very frustrating for patients and physicians, and we change our th therapeutic approaches. Sometimes you change monoclonal. Sometimes you can add in an older uh, preventive to try and to try and change things uh, to try and get on on top of things. I think it's about disease change as much as it is anything else. Absolutely. And so let's also talk about. You mentioned these older drugs. Let's talk about how you approach the propranolols, the tapiramates, the, uh, the antidepressants, uh, the nutraceuticals. And of course, it's a patient conversation and shared decision making. But in your mind, how do you see these treatments? Now, I grew up, so to speak, using the sort of medicines you're talking about that we're talking about there as the staples. And like, like anything, you don't realize how troublesome they are till you have something uh, something better. I tip my first go-to of the, you know, I'd say classic or the non-specific preventives, if I could use the term that way, is candesartan over all the ones that you've mentioned because it's a once daily dosing. There's no weight gain. There's no cognitive effect. There's no sedation apart from a little bit of dizziness with maybe 15% or so of people is generally well tolerated. So it's my first thing to go to. It's utterly frustrating in terms of what the mechanism of action uh, must be. So I, te I, I tend to, f firstly, most of us in neurology or, or in headache specialist practice will see patients who've had one or other preventive usually. It's unusual for someone not to have had, say, globally to have had propranolol because the most commonly used preventive on the in the world or in the US to pyramate because that's the number one prescribed preventive. So we usually don't, I mean, I'm very happy not to have to go back down that road and be really exceptional. I can't remember the last time that I wanted to go back down that road. But I will tell them about um, 
about the use of uh, Candace Sarton. Of course, these, these are off-license discussions, and we should say that to listeners, that there are two randomised controlled, placebo-controlled trials with Candace Sarton, but it's not, li- not licensed, so that I want to be really clear about it. Other non-licensed things that can be useful, memantine, um, for, for which there's a, a one placebo-controlled trial, other non-licensed things, uh, melatonin, uh, for which there's a nice randomised controlled trial compared with amitriptyline, which it uh, outperformed. So I, I think that... You know, if one knows you need to know about these broader, older things, be able to have the conversation with people who um, say the insurance people say that you can't, you have to have failed three things to get a monoclonal. It's not catastrophic. I mean, it's reasonable to have the have the uh, have the conversation and kind of move on. I don't sit there looking like the world's going to collapse because I can't just go straight to a, a G-Pen or a monoclonal because it doesn't inspire any confidence in the person sitting in front of you to go, oh, woe is me, oh, uh, this is hopeless, I have to give you something hopeless. Blah. It, I'm not sure it helps. Um, so, uh, you know, the other use drugs that have some reasonable track record that are reasonably tolerated and I'm I, I'm happily surprised very often that we that we can make some progress. But I'm not a big user of uh, particularly to pyramine so I think that can be very unpleasant when the side effects sit in and what about let's talk about the abortives uh, the G pans in comparison to the trip tans obviously we still have the NSAIDs we have one dit tan a uh, last minute and so what is your approach there well it's mostly about realism a medical system that would allow Everyone who needs something to get the thing they need is a reasonable system. And if that means some people get a trip down and it works for them, I don't, I'm not going to cry over spilt milk. I think, you know, if you push the fast forward button and the, and the price was the same, then more people would start with a G-Pan because it's simply a simpler choice to, to use than a, a trip down. I'm pretty reassured by the two post hoc meta analyses that the G Pan folks did, one with Romagipan and the other one with uh, Ubrogipan, that showed that people who are naive to a triptan are more likely in both groups for Ubrogipan or Romagipan are more likely than um, placebo active because it's a their post hoc analyses from the placebo control trials more likely to respond but also current triptan uh if you take a current triptan user if they take a g pant they'll do better than placebo and happily if you take people who failed one or more uh triptans they'll do better than uh, placebo so if a person's happy with a triptan why rock the boat if they, if you have to prescribe a triptan, it's not catastrophic. They've been around for 35 years or so. We know a lot about them. We've got all the randomized trials. You can build on them. You know, I, if, if I usually would start with sumatriptan because all the others were compared against it. And then if person doesn't like it, they can tell you why they don't like it and you can work it out logically. And if you started with the G-Pant, that wouldn't be catastrophic either. Um, you, you would do quite well. It'll be largely constrained by um, what's available. And then, of course, whether there are any... Um, contraindication. There aren't to me real clear dyed in the wool contraindications to a trip tan. So I think we'll we're going to be using trip tans for the foreseeable future, at least my foreseeable future. So what would you say to some people uh, and you know we sometimes guide people that you know the idea of treating early for migraine, wait, mm. wait till the pain is mild. But for some people that have higher frequencies that could mean using a lot of trip tans. So what do you say to maybe some critics that would have concern about using a pharmaceutical during a non-headache moment? I think up till we had G-Pants, that was a very perfectly reasonable concern, be that with triptan med- over, over, medication overuse or even with non-steroidals um, causing GI symptomatology. Up to the advent of the, the G-Pant, perfectly reasonable thing to say. In the G-Pant era, I think it's a very different um, a different proposition. It's pretty clear that from the preventive studies that if you take a Tojapan as an example every day, you don't get more headache, you get less. And in fact, there was an abstract I was involved in at the International Headache Society uh, um, that looked at the not, looked at an individual patient level at increases in headache frequency in the placebo versus the actively treated atojapan group. And more patients in the placebo group during the treatment phase had increases in their headache frequency than did the atojapan treated group, which, you know, says this idea that you can make things worse clinically 
there doesn't seem to be panning out. In the laboratory, uh, we've shown indeed that you don't get uh, you don't get sensitization in exper- in the experimental animals with uh, with repeated use of uh, of a G pant, whereas you do with a do with a triptan. That's been shown specifically for Ubrojapan by Frank Pareko and his colleagues, and for um, Alsegi pant by Phil Holland and colleagues at King. So the, there's good basic science for this, and it's panning out in panning out in clinical practice. And then you look at things like um, Noel Rosen presented some very nice prescription claims data that showed that on the introduction of Romagipant use, the use of opioids reduced. I mean, the use of opioids reduced. I mean, I think it's pretty clear whatever way you sort of cook the, cook the goose, so to speak, uh, uh, no, to cook the turkey, I probably should say, um, <laughs> given our recording date, it's pretty clear that these drugs don't make things worse. In fact, second daily use of romagipant makes things better, daily use of atogipant makes things better. You know, I understand the concern. It's historically reasonable. It's part of the evolution of our field. This is just not something that's manifesting with the G-pant. So, no, I don't think it's a concern and it, because the evidence is the more you use these drugs, the better you get. So, you know, good. I think this is really important conversation and we really also need to talk about equitable access to these treatments that, as you mentioned, are life-saving, uh, saving uh, so much time. Um, so let's talk about equitable access and health disparities in migraine. Well, there isn't equitable access. Whether you start with the clinical trials, there's a demographic in the clinical trials which has been the same for the last 30 years, and it's not a demographic that reflects certainly anywhere where the studies were done, without I want to criticise anyone in particular, but that it, it's not, I'm not criticising the companies, I'm not criticising any individual investigators. It's the system, and the system is not well stacked for the disadvantage. It means that the access to these medicines is severely restricted, away from people who, if they can't function properly, it's a different implication for their life. If you have to go to work, and we all have to go to work, but if missing a day's work is about getting bread on the table, peace rates and people who are paid by the hour or by the day, that's more than just I had a bad day. That's my whole family had a really bad day. My kids had an unfair day. I think that health disparities that affect migraine, because they affect families and they'll affect, let's say it, I mean, they're going to affect single mothers because migraine affects more women. And the single mother who's got two or three children and needs that day's work, who only gets half a day's work or misses a couple of days' work, there's a whole downstream effect of that. And I find it really quite disturbing to think about how much that person suffers and then how much they suffer in the broader context because they have that kind of They've got the whole guilt thing. They've got a lot of burdens. Mm -hmm. And for a simple, relatively straightforward treatments that we have, I don't know what the solution is, but I think the problems are are really can be a bit, can can be heartbreaking, really. Yeah. And um, well, I think conversations are really important because if you don't have that conversation, um, you know, eyes don't open. There's not awareness and there's not maybe change in policies down the line. Yes. I mean, I, I know that uh, Rami Burstein is incoming uh, International Headache Society president and is quite exercised by getting certain migraine drugs on the World Health Organization absolute necessary list and more power to him for trying to do that because you might, you know, again, one thinks that it's part of the problem of migraine. Oh, no one dies. Fine. But people's children suffer because the consequences of migraine for their parents. That's just totally wrong. And as our abilities to improve therapy are advancing, surely we have an obligation to make sure that those improvements are seen by everyone who could benefit from them. And and not only do the individuals benefit, but the entirety of society benefits from making sure that everyone has a reasonable access to good treatments for migraine. And you say no one dies, but, um, you know, I think Ann Scherer published on this many years ago about the downward mobility associated with migraine. And we know with downward mobility, there's a decreased access to health care, education, all of these social indicators that are associated with increased morbidity. So 
I, I think the research, it's, we need to do the research. I agree with you. I just hate to think about children who just don't get a decent meal today because of the financial constraints and the difficulties of migraine within a house. I think that's just, that's just wrong. So um, I have listened to many, many, many of your lectures by now, and you always have a hope part of it. And so you're no pressure to you, but you're the sixth person, sixth expert on our series, and I want to end with some hope. So what are you hopeful about? Ah, well, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, three things I'd say. Firstly, we're going to understand the disease better. All of the things that we're doing with functional imaging, genetics, our understood, what we're talking about, the drugs getting into the CSF actions on the brain, the promontory prodromal symptoms, we're getting better at understanding the disease and we're turning that into new therapy. So I think that's the, that's the first thing to say. The second thing is to say we're already starting to see what's next after the CGRPs. We've got pituitary adenylate, cyclase activating polypeptide. I'll bet that it's going to be on the podcast next year. Entirely different target entirely new opportunity so you know you can look at someone in the face who's not responded to anything you can think of and you can say with hand on heart that the next thing is is moving along so there's a we're definitely going to do better year on on year you know and the third thing about hope and maybe it's the, the broadest thing is when i look at something like particularly like the g pants and i look at them when they're um off patent and when they're cheap and when, you know, when they're, well, there'll be a day when they're going to be worth pennies. That means the whole world, and I mean all the people who can't afford these things now or can't do it, will, will one day get the benefit of everything we're doing. And that's, that is something to look forward to. So it's, everything is going to get better. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for being here and sharing all of these updates with us. It's, I think, been really informative and useful to our listeners. Thank you. And thank you again for listening to the November special podcast series in headache medicine. Hi, this is Tisha Manteith with the Neurology Podcast. Welcome back to our November headache series. This is our last session. I promise you it's going to be a good one. This time we're going to be focusing on rapid developments in neuromodulation. With me to discuss is our special guest, Stuart Tepper, Vice President of New England Institute for Neurology and Headache in Stamford, Connecticut. Well, Stu, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's an absolute pleasure, Tisha. Well, you know, we had you on years ago, and I have to go back and listen to that because I know we didn't discuss all that we're going to discuss today. Well, I'm looking forward to talking about non-invasive neuromodulation for neurologists because a lot has changed. We learned a lot more. We have six devices that are FDA cleared. It's really a very exciting area where a general neurologist can really make a difference. And I know you've led a lot of this research, so it's a special treat to have you here. Why don't we talk about, just give us a broad overview of these different devices that are available to the neurologists. With your permission, what I'd like to do is to start with a case, because I think if, as a neurologist, you're thinking about these devices, which are FDA cleared, they're not significant risk, I'll take you through them. It's pretty good to have an idea about the kind of patient you might consider with these. So I was thinking about a 27-year-old woman who... I've seen who has disabling high frequency episodic migraine. So she has headache less than 15 days per month, but these are pretty disabling. And a good neurologist had seen her and prescribed amitriptyline, but she found it too sedating and topiramate, which gave her cognitive impairment and propranolol, which made her lightheaded. And for acute treatment, she tried sumatriptan, which gave her chest tightness, and risotriptan, which was too sedating, and zolmatriptan, which gave her nausea, and naritriptan was too slow and didn't really work. And she tried the two oral G pants, and they were too slow. And she's a working person and didn't want to try lasmiditan because she needs to drive, and her attacks occur during the day. And, of course, she adds she's thinking about getting pregnant, and she wants to stop contraception. And migraine demographics are very often women of childbearing age. So thinking about this patient all along, then we can talk about the six devices. 
Did she Google you and like Googled non-drug options expert? <laughs> no, she just uh, challenged me and said, what are you going to do for me? You know, okay. I, need, I need prevention and I knew need acute treatment and here's all the things I've tried and uh, what are you going to do for me? Plus, I need to get pregnant. So that is kind of in my wheelhouse. And so I shared with her what I would share with my colleagues, which is that we have six non-invasive neuromodulation devices for migraine. And five of the six are cleared for both the acute treatment of migraine and the preventive treatment for migraine. And I always say that this is like the Berlin Wall, which got torn down, where one side it was acute treatment of migraine yeah. and the other side is preventive treatment of migraine. And down it comes because we have these devices that work both ways. They work both acute and preventive. We have one that's only FDA cleared for acute, but which is being studied for prevention. So probably by this time next year, we'll have uh, all six of them will be cleared. So I think what I'll do is just briefly highlight them. There are two devices that work almost identically. And these are devices that they use a pad and they go over the eyebrows and they sit over the supratrochlear and supraorbital nerves. And they stimulate the first division of five, the first division of the trigeminal nerve, by stimulating afferents, supratrochlear and uh, supraorbital afferents. And these two devices, one is technically called an external trigeminal stimulator, or ETNS, and the name under which it's marketed is Cephaly. And the other actually is called a transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulator. So it's actually called a TENS, and that is sold under the Editerm. So Cephaly and Hediterm are the two brands of stimulators that go on above the eye and are turned on for 20 minutes, for 60 minutes, for two hours, depending on the need. And we'll circle back and talk about those two devices as you wish. The third device that works by a completely different mechanism is a single pulse transcranial magnetic stimulator or STMS. And this is a shoebox sized device, which one plugs in and charges and then by turning it on, it's placed on the occiput. And when the patient hits a button, it discharges a magnetic charge that goes probably as far forward as the thalamus and as far down as the brainstem and upper cervical cord, probably the trigeminous cervical complex. And it's sold under the name Savvy Dual. So STMS is the third device. The fourth device is a non-invasive vagal nerve stimulator, which looks like a old Norelco razor, for those of you that remember this. And it's placed over the vagus with a little bit of electro gel and turned on for two-minute cycles. And it is, again, approved for both acute and preventive treatment of migraine. It has some FDA clearance also in cluster headache and some of the other trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. So we'll come back to that. And sold under the, the name Gamacore Sapphire. The next one is a device that goes on the arm. The device turns on stays on for 45 minutes and terminates migraine. And if it's used for 45 minutes every other day, it's FDA cleared to prevent migraine. And that's called a remote electrical neuromodulation device or REN and is marketed under the name Norivio. Final device sits over the eyebrows, but it's more like Princess Leah's tiara <laughs> because it has electrodes that go over the supraorbital and supratrochlear nerves, but also over the occipital nerves and back. So it's a combined occipital trigeminal neurostimulator that is marketed under the name Relivion, and that currently is FDA cleared only for acute treatment, but it's being studied for preventive treatment and preliminary case series suggests that it too works both acutely and preventively. Those are the six devices. So you spoke about the patient and they all have similar indications, right, for migraine and then some for trigeminal autonomic cephalgias. But just speaking about this patient with migraine, how do you select which device to use? 
the first question to ask the patient is, is she a veteran? If she's a veteran, most of these devices are covered by the VA. The second question to ask is, and I do this with the patient, is are you independently wealthy? Because some people are rich enough that they can afford anything, so cost does not become an object. But most people, cost is a big issue, and not one of these devices is being covered by commercial insurance. There are a few that have carved out individual deals in which commercial insurance is paying for them. There's one deal with the Tufts healthcare system. There's another deal with the University of Utah healthcare system. You have to luck out if you happen to be a patient in one of those systems that where these devices are covered. But in general, they are not covered patients will have to pay out of pocket. At that point, it behooves the neurologist to know how much they cost because we end up going essentially by cost. And I'll be glad to go through those as we go. They've not been studied against each other. So we do not know which is the most effective. And because we don't know that, we end up often deciding based on cost, letting a patient try them for three months or four months. And if they're not doing well, then moving to the next least expensive device. Each of them is non-significant risk. That's the designation. So that means they're not going to have significant side effects with them. They may feel the device, they may feel odd aspects of the device, but in general, they're not going to have side effects. And although not one of them is FDA cleared for use in pregnancy, it's pretty hard to think that a stimulation of the first division of five is going to give anybody a problem. And the single pulse transcranial magnetic stimulator is actually approved in the UK for use during pregnancy. And the one that goes on the arm, the remote electrical neuromodulation device, Audrey Halpern published a paper this year evaluating actually in a pretty clever way how gestation ended up, what the size of the fetus was, what the health of the baby was. And there was no concern with respect to the remote electrical neuromodulation device with respect to any of the gestational outcomes. I'm therefore pretty comfortable using Cephaly, the single pulse transcranial magnetic stimulator, or the remote electrical neuromodulation device in patients that are planning to get pregnant and really even during their pregnancies. Remember, this is not on label, but again, I'm pretty comfortable. The magnet discharge does not go below the neck, and it's just difficult for me to see how the other ones would pose a risk in a pregnancy. Do you use them, Tisha? Absolutely. Cost is obviously an issue, and I'm really glad you brought that up because we need to do better in terms of our advocacy and access to care. But given someone that had resources or a veteran, I guess these devices are used differently. One, you're holding a device upon the neck for a few minutes at a time. The other, a band around the arm. So I guess there's some preference there, and it's a shared decision with the patient. That's exactly right. One talks about it with patients. How sensitive are they? Where is their pain? If they're having a lot of pain anteriorly, they may be good candidates for cephaly or head of term, or the device may bother them too much without cutaneous allodynia, and they won't be able to tolerate it. And then an arm device or a magnetic device might be much better for them. The arm device, the remote electrical neuromodulation device, is the most discreet. That one can be put under a sweater, under a shirt, turned on. Nobody knows it's on. It buzzes for 45 minutes and people would not know that it's on there. And in the preventive trial, that device worked in prevention in the second month of going 45 minutes every other day compared to sham. So it worked very rapidly in prevention as well as quite effectively in prevention for all the primary and secondary outcomes. So from a convenience and discretion standpoint, the remote electrical neuromodulation device is probably the least objectionable and it has the advantage of being both acute and preventive. But the Cephaly device, people can buy. And once they own it, then the only cost for using it 
is $25 for three electrodes, which have to be renewed about every two or three months. The cost of the Cephaly device goes up and down. It's around $400 one time to own it. Monthly payments are available. While the remote electrical neuromodulation device is $49 for one device, and each device has enough juice in it to treat 18 times. So if somebody's using it every other day, that's certainly enough for a month. Plus, a patient can use it acutely on top of the 45 minutes every other day. And then the device cost, there are different deals with respect to how much the devices would cost, bundles of three and so on later. Those two are the most affordable at this point. The other ones have various uh, limitations on price, which we can go over. The most important thing to know about the Cephaly and the Hediterm devices are that they don't require a prescription. Patients can buy those without a prescription. All of the other ones require sending a prescription to the company, and the neurologist needs to get the address and the fax number or however they're going to send their prescription to the company to get those devices for patients. So you spoke about high-frequency migraine. What about chronic migraine? Well, they all have either explicit approval for all of migraine or their clearance is broad enough that it looks like it covers all of migraine. For example, the remote electrical neuromodulation device was explicitly cleared for both episodic and chronic migraine. The chronic migraine clearance for that device came after a case series for it. We don't have any randomized control trials, to my knowledge, that were explicitly for chronic migraine. For example, the regulatory trial on the single pulse transcranial magnetic stimulator involved people who had anywhere from 4 to 24 migraine days per month, so it included people with episodic and chronic. However, having said all of that, I use them all in episodic and chronic migraine, And in addition to the lack of side effects, in addition to the safety and tolerability, these devices can work when medications have failed. And Peter Goadsby, I always quote him on this, he he says that you have a patient in front of you that's had 20 or 30 medications fail. That just means that the targets for those medicines were not appropriate for that particular patient's migraine. These devices modulate the brain, and they therefore modulate targets that we know about and targets that we don't know about. And there are a great number of patients for whom medicines fail and for whom non-invasive neuromodulation is effective. And they are at one end of the spectrum of appropriate patients. They're the ones who you've tried a million things and everything's failed, either due to lack of efficacy or adverse events. The other end are the people early on who don't want to take medicines for one reason or another. They may be tech savvy, they may like to embrace new technology, and they can use them primarily acutely or as an adjunct to an existing treatment plan. And there are those who are taking multiple medicines and having not perfect control, but have a high potential for drug-drug interactions. Again, you can add non-invasive neuromodulation and not have to worry about that. Finally, I can't resist mentioning one area that I always teach my fellows about, which is in a patient in whom adherence or therapy commitment is a problem, you're always a little nervous about sending them off with a prescription for a drug and not being sure whether they'll follow through or adhere properly. With the non-invasive neuromodulation devices, they have to have the skin in the game. They have to make the commitment, and you're shifting the locus of control to the patient. If they fill it, if they use it, if they come back, that's great. If they don't do that and they disappear, you haven't done any harm. Above all, do no harm. So we do use it in that area as well. Great. So I think you hit most of the indications for prescribing these treatments. Let's talk a little bit about mechanisms of action because it's really very interesting. And as you mentioned, there are targets that we think we know, targets that we don't know, but go for it. <laughs> 
I'll just give you my simplistic way of looking at these. I think that the way they work is they modulate the brain by peripheral access to central pathways. And one can actually adjust frequency and intensity and wavelength in some of these devices and get paradoxical effects. Over the years, we've learned what the appropriate frequency pulse width and so on on these devices should be to achieve the goal. Let's start with the remote electrical neuromodulation device. That works by a very unique mechanism. It's a psychophysical reflex called condition pain modulation, which has been described and in which pain in location A inhibits pain in location B. And we know this from a psychophysical research in which the mechanical pressure pain threshold in the great toe is greater if a patient has the contralateral and put into a bucket of ice water till it really hurts. And you can put a lot more pressure on the toe before it hurts. And what the REN device does is the patient adjusts it and buzzes the arm until it really hurts, and then moves it down below the pain threshold, but it's enough to activate nociceptive afferents. And so the nociceptive afferent input from the arm is terminating the migraine, which is in a different location, via a brainstem reflex. It's very clever. The front stimulators, cephaly and hetaterm, I mentioned, go in on supraorbital and supratrochlear trigeminal branches, and they do send signals down to the trigeminous cervical complex where they likely have inhibitory effects. There's also some cortical change that's been documented on functional imaging with long-term use of those devices. And remember that the combined occipital trigeminal neurostimulator also works in the front via those nerve branches. Three devices then work over the forehead in that way. The non-invasive vagal nerve stimulator sends a signal in on the vagus and ascends through the thalamus and has inhibitory effects on thalamocortical pathways. And for the most part, does not have efferent vagal impact on cardiac function and GI function. It's mostly ascending inhibitory and thalamocortical pathways that are affected by the NVNS. Now, interestingly, both the NVNS device, so the vagal nerve stimulator and the single pulse transcranial magnetic stimulator, both interrupt cortical spreading depolarization. And so both of them can terminate aura which is caused by cortical spreading depolarization. And the STMS device also inhibits thalamocortical pathways. It's interesting that these two devices that work by such different mechanisms, one going in on the vagus, one a magnetic pulse posteriorly, both inhibit thalamocortical pathways and cortical spreading depolarization. And finally, the combined occipital trigeminal neurostimulator sends inhibitory pathways through the greater occipital nerve into the trigeminous cervical complex, pretty similarly to what we do when we do greater occipital nerve blocks for migraine. Each of these then rides these peripheral access pathways to modulate central pain pathways. Excellent. And you were indicating earlier about the Berlin Wall and the difference between acute indications, preventive indications, and the blurring. So when we think about mechanisms of action, what are these devices telling us about the migraine brain? Well, it's not a single switch, is it? The study that I always show the residents and fellows was an N equals one study by Schultz and Schulte and Arna Mai that was published several years ago in Brain. And this was a patient who agreed to have functional imaging every morning at 10 a.m. for a month and not take migraine medicine during her three migraines across that month. And what was seen from a functional imaging standpoint was 
stereotypical changes in functional connectivity between hypothalamus, upper brainstem, and trigeminous cervical complex, in which there was a change in the relationship of those areas of the brain going into an attack, and then a reset after the attack. Same for each of the attacks. It would seem to me that these devices can modulate slowly the relationships involved in that functional connectivity, as well as acutely terminate attacks via certain mechanisms. So we know that occipital nerve blocks can stop a migraine, so it makes sense that if you stimulate with an inhibitory stimulus along the greater occipital nerve, should be able to stop a migraine. We know that conditioned pain modulation involves termination of pain in a different area from where you're activating nociceptive afferents. We know that interrupting cortical spreading depolarization stops aura. So we can find our way to how these devices work both acutely and preventively. I don't think we have all the answers, but I think we're getting smarter about it as we go. And so uh, you spoke about the FDA clearance across the board for these devices and the confidence we can have in its safety. Let's talk a little bit about contraindications. I've read pacemakers being a contraindication. What other contraindications should we be aware of? Well, for the non-invasive vagal nerve stimulator, the presence of vascular disease is a relative contraindication. And obviously, indwelling devices for most of these non-invasive neuromodulation devices are generally, if not explicitly contraindicated in the prescribing information, one would hesitate to use them. Of course, it depends on what kind of implanted device one is talking about, but nonetheless, I tend to shy away from them. If they've had injury to the skull, where you're thinking about having the patient put a non-invasive neuromodulation device on, I would be hesitant about that. Having said all of that, it's very rare to have a patient where there are contraindications to all of them. And generally, there are not a lot of contraindications. I'd be a little hesitant in people with vascular disease. I would definitely be hesitant in people with cardiac arrhythmias. But I might be tempted to use, for example, cephaly or hetaterm or even the remote electrical neurostimulator in somebody with known vascular disease. Great. So why don't we talk a little bit about the other indications? We spoke a bit about migraine, but let's talk about trigeminal autonomic cephalgias and any other indications that you're aware of. It's a very quick discussion. Only one of these devices has FDA clearance for the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. And that is the non-invasive vagal nerve stimulator, the gamma core device. And in fact, in the VA system, the gamma core device becomes the first line device for treating patients, for example, with cluster. The device is cleared for the acute treatment of episodic cluster headache attacks. And a patient would do three two-minute stimulations over the neck, wait three minutes and do three more two-minute stimulations if needed, and can treat up to four attacks or 24 stimulations in a day. It doesn't seem to work for acute treatment of chronic cluster attacks, so be aware of that. It's also FDA cleared for the prevention of cluster headache, both episodic and chronic, but only as an adjunctive add-on. This was from a German study in which patients were on standard of care cluster prevention, and the NVNS device was added in one group and not added in the other group, and the number of attacks per week was considerably lower with the NVNS device, and the subcutaneous sumatriptan and oxygen use was also decreased. So the FDA cleared it as an add-on for both episodic and chronic cluster headache treatment. Very interestingly, the NVNS device was also cleared by the FDA for treatment of paroxysmal hemicrania and hemicrania continua. These are two 
trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias that are indomethacin responsive. In fact, response to indomethacin is part of the diagnostic criteria, but there are an awful lot of people that cannot take indomethacin. And two two two-minute stimulations three times a day, either acutely or preventively for paroxysmal hemicrania or hemicrania continua, have been found to be effective in a few small case series that the FDA used to clear these devices. This MVNS device is the only therapy that is cleared by the FDA or approved by the FDA for the prevention of chronic cluster headache and the only therapy that's cleared by the FDA for paroxysmal hemicrania and hemicrania continua. Indomethacin doesn't have an FDA approval. So this device can be very helpful in patients with trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. And we spoke a bit about chronic cluster headache. I think we should spend some time talking about spinopalatine ganglion simulator, not available but promising and also says something about the biology. The sphenopalatine ganglion is the final common pathway for the efferents causing cluster headache. We know that cluster has a generator probably in the ipsilateral posterior hypothalamus. From there, neurons go to the superior salivatory nucleus, a parasympathetic seventh nerve nucleus. And then preganglionic parasympathetics go from the superior salivatory nucleus to the sphenopalatine ganglion, where they synapse. Postganglionic parasympathetics are the efferents that go out for most of the cluster headache symptoms, the lacrimation and the rhinorrhea and the diaphoresis. And implanted SPG or sphenopalatine ganglion stimulator was invented And this device was screwed in above the teeth, could be put in with minimal conscious anesthesia, and it did not have any indwelling batteries or wires, and an external stimulator could be recharged and programmed like a paddle to turn the stimulator on, and it worked both acutely and preventively for both episodic and chronic cluster headache. It received CE approval in the EU and based on one randomized control trial. And there was a completed regulatory trial in the US. Peter Goesby was the principal author on that. Again, it worked well. Again, it worked both acutely and preventively. But there was a problem with the toxicology work in the animal models. And even though it had CE mark in Europe, the company which developed it, and which marketed it went bankrupt. And as a result, the intellectual property and the remaining devices were purchased by another company, and that company actually submitted and received from the FDA a breakthrough device designation several years ago, but so far the device has not seen the light of day again. And it's really a shame because it was a very dramatically effective treatment for cluster. And one last point I can't resist making about this is if one set the frequency uh, low in terms of the stimulation of this device, one could trigger a cluster attack in the patient. And if one set it at a high frequency, it essentially gave a block to the outflow from the SPG and it would terminate the cluster attack. So it was dramatic evidence that we understood the anatomy of cluster and could turn the volume up and volume down, turn on attacks and turn off attacks. Excellent. Well, I hope we hear more about that. Me too. Let's talk about the future. What other devices should we be on the lookout for? There are several devices that work on the trigeminal system or the vagal system, but enter through other peripheral branches, some of which are already approved in the EU. And these, for the most part, go in through branches around the ear and are posterior auricular, but there is one in the EU that actually works, I think, similarly to the remote electrical neuromodulation device, but goes in via the wrist. There is also a device that has already completed several randomized control trials, which pulses through the ear air pressure and appears to work 
both acutely and preventively by pulsing through the ear. There was a device that got FDA clearance that was a stimulator or a modulator of the vestibular system. And that device got full FDA clearance for uh, treatment of migraine, and the company pivoted and decided to move into a different therapeutic area. But again, that might see the light of day. And I remain optimistic that there will be other non-invasive neuromodulation devices that will be appropriately tested over the next several years and the companies will move fairly rapidly to get FDA clearance. It's a lot easier to get FDA clearance than approval for a drug. And that enables smaller companies who are nimble to develop new ideas in neuromodulation. So it seems like there's been a lot of progress, but also the financial aspects that go into technology. And maybe we need to figure out some type of crowdfunding uh, issue to kind of help push these these companies forward. Yeah, I want to tell you about something you may not be aware of, which adds to the misery of the access problem. We all know about the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. In June of 2022, CMS essentially designated any external peripheral electrical nerve stimulation by definition a TENS device with a capped purchase price average of $428. The external trigeminal neurostimulator over the forehead for pediatric ADHD, CMS capped at $36 a month. And the CMS requires a certain duration of effect um, in terms of how long the device should last before they'll cover it. So with respect to the remote electrical neuromodulation device, they said that devices, in order for them to cover them, the device has to have a minimum lifetime requirement of three years. And therefore, the remote electrical neuromodulation device, which has enough juice to treat 18 times, did not meet the three-year requirement, and they priced that as a zero reimbursement. So... The problem that CMS put together is that if you go to the trouble of developing one of these devices, you really can't go down the CMS pathway to get reimbursement. Now, fortunately, the VA and the Department of Defense has been willing to cover these at appropriate cost and appropriate cost for the company and minimal cost to the patient, if any. But it is a complicated problem for us to get access for our patients. I would say that the access is the biggest problem of all in the use of non-invasive neuromodulation for neurologists. Absolutely. And I'm really glad that you touched upon that because that's a real practical issue and certainly an advocacy issue. The problem. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because I think we have randomized control trials that shows these devices work and work well. The FDA's looked at them and they're safe and tolerable with non-significant risk. They play a very important role for therapy of primary headache disorders and nobody can afford the half of them. Absolutely. There are several devices that have clearance in either the EU or the UK. One is a kinetic oscillating device. One is a transcutaneous direct current stimulator. There is a combined front and back two units that's made by Cephaly that has CE mark. And actually, there's a device called the MIND, M-Y-N-D device, that's got clearance in the UK that's similar to Cephaly and Editerm. Depends where you live, whether these devices are cleared by particular countries, whether there's reimbursement whether they have CE mark, but unfortunately, when I talk to my European colleagues, for the most part, they have the same problem we have. Patients can't afford them for the most part. One thing we didn't talk about is which of these devices is cleared in pediatrics. And I'm happy to say that three of them are FDA cleared for both adolescents and adults. 
And those are the single pulse transcranial magnetic stimulator, the non-invasive vagal nerve stimulator, and the remote electrical neuromodulation device. And in adolescence, very often, and I don't need to tell my neurology colleagues this, the adolescents don't want to take drugs. And the parents themselves are often very amenable to having a kid put on one of these devices when they get a migraine and not have that child on a daily medicine or even using some of the uh, available FDA-approved medicines such as triptans during their attacks. So I would encourage you to think about the use of these devices for adolescents, the STMS, the NVNS, and the remote electrical neuromodulation device, because again, all three of them are FDA cleared for both acute and preventive treatment of migraine. Well, I know this technology is wonderful for many of our patients. Access, access, access is an issue. But if we really talk to many of our patients, we know medication adherence is a problem. Lifestyle adherence is a problem. And so at least for the right patient, it's it's nice to have other options. I really agree. And I must say that I've integrated these devices in my practice. And when I'm busy, I don't think a day goes by or every other day goes by where I'm not suggesting one of them to a patient. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast and sharing your knowledge. Well, thank you. I want to leave my fellow neurologists with a lot of hope about these devices. If you can talk to patients about the cost, you'll find they're very helpful as adjunctive treatment in your migraine patients. Well, thank you for being on the November Headache Series Neurology Podcast. And to our listeners, thank you again for listening. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please Take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to